Lord with us. And let us exalt God's name together. Welcome once again to the sanctuary of St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church. The church living out God's commandment to love through a commitment to serve. We are truly excited to join you once again, both in person and virtually. And we have so much to thank God for. We are just excited to be in the Lord's presence once again. Join me now in our morning call to worship. Worldly treachery and fear could not stop hope. God's, God's light, whose, whose sign was a star, was poured out for the people. All the fears and flights of the of this world cannot diminish God's light. That light is the light of Jesus Christ, who breaks through the darkness. Thanks be to God for the most precious gift of light. Let us give these people of a new light and hope.
let us go to the throne of grace. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you this morning. Lord, it's raining outside, Lord Jesus, but it purifies and it cleanses this land that you have made for us. Lord, we thank you this morning because without you, we could do nothing. Our day would be nothing. But Lord, you have blessed us. You have touched us. Even though there's a lot of things going on this day, Lord Jesus, COVID is everywhere. But Lord, you have told us what we need to do. So Lord, we thank you this morning for keeping your loving hands upon our lives, Lord Jesus, because we couldn't do anything without your hand upon us. Lord, we thank you for our St. James family this morning. We thank you for those that are listening in this morning, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you because you blessed us in so many ways, Lord, ways that we don't have any idea what you've done for us. But Lord, we know we are your children and that you bless us in a special way. So Lord, it's all about you this day. It's all about you every day. Yeah, yeah. Because we can't do anything without you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just need to keep our mind and our hearts on you so that you would lead and guide us and let us know what it is that we should do. And for that, we thank you this morning for blessing us and our families, Lord Jesus. Continue to keep your hand upon us, Lord. And we will forever give you all the praise and all the glory. Because if we do this in your darling son, Jesus' name, let us say amen. 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 amen and amen. amen. Our scripture reading this morning is coming from Psalms 29, verse 1 to 11. And this is the voice of God in a great storm. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syria like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to swirl and strikes the forest bare. And in his temple all say, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers, readers, and doers of his holy word. Let us all say amen. amen. What a friend we have in Jesus.
we have a Savior, all we have to do is bend our knees. Sometimes we got to fall on our face and say, God, I need you. God, I, this is what I can't handle. God, I, I don't know what to do. And just know, when we take it to the Lord in prayer, the Lord will handle everything we need the Lord to handle. Amen. Amen. Somebody can put your hands together. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord comes from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. I would ask that you, in your devotional time, would go back to Isaiah 42 and read from the 14th verse on down through the end of that chapter and then uh, attach that to Isaiah 43 verses 1 through 7. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honor, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for you. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather them up. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Be seated, those of you who are standing. And I want to use as a title those first two words from the first verse. But now. But now. But now. <laughs> Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that brought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me, so he looked beyond my faults and saw my need. And I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. And the words of this song ring clearly in the ears of, of every believer. We we get excited about the, how, how, the idea of how God operates. We, we love knowing that God is present and God is working in our lives. We'll, we'll run the aisles when we hear God look beyond our faults and saw our needs. Now, now, God's ability to look beyond our faults is appealing to us as believers because of the way we view God. Many of us view God as a benevolent spiritual parent who remembers we need help. God is a divine entity that's full of love and compassion and caring and forgiveness. That's all true. But there is one thing that has bothered me, and honestly it should bother you, about that particular view of God. When we look at God this way, we begin to negate the consequences of sinful action. Too, too many believers think that we can sin, say, I'm sorry, be forgiven, and that's it. Uh, and it's not that simple. Uh, too many of us ignore the consequences, or worse, we think we're just supposed to walk away unscathed. Nothing is supposed to happen to us, but we need to remember that no matter whether we are saved or not saved, our wrongdoing, our, our actions all have consequences. If you spend years smoking, you're more than likely to develop lung cancer. 
If you repeatedly have unprotected sex, you are likely to become a parent much more quickly than you really wanted to. Uh, if you don't get vaccinated, you are many more times likely to contract and possibly die from COVID-19. If you continue to drink sodas and eat an overabundance of cakes and pies, you will gain weight and throw your A1C into double digits. If you continue to eat ribs and pork chops and fat back and chitlins, your, your blood pressure will sooner or later be 200 over 100. And you'll be wondering why. There are consequences to our actions. Ancient Israelites in the book of Isaiah were in the middle of dealing with the consequences of their sin. Isaiah was an, a prophet in the 8th century BCE, and he was called to address the sins of idolatry, lack of faith, hypocrisy, social and economic injustice. Israel was a nation that was supposed to worship God and God alone, but they started looking at other gods. When, when things were not comfortable, they started looking at other gods. When things got to be stressful, they started to look at other gods. When, when things got confusing, they started to look at other gods. When, when the God they were supposed to be worshiping didn't answer quick, fast, and in a hurry, they started to look at other gods. They began to worship idols. That, and, and that worship of idols came from a lack of faith. You know, some people, they, they have faith for a couple of minutes or a couple of days. It's, and I'll admit, it's easy to have faith when you first find out something is happening and you pray to God and say, God, I believe. But when that something keeps on happening for the next weeks and months and possibly years, sometimes you lose faith. Sometimes you say, I, I just can't do this. I'm just tired. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Israel was like that. They, they watched God work. They'd seen God work before. But every time something happened and God didn't move fast enough, they lost faith. Not only did they lose faith, but they were hypocritical. They, and the, the social elite, they pretended that they loved God, but they didn't love the folk that they saw every day. They, they acted like they loved God when they went to the synagogue, but when there was somebody poor, or somebody homeless, or somebody that needed food, many of them turned their heads and walked the other way. Or worse, they exploited them. They, they made them work for nothing or very little or promised to do something for them, and nothing ever happened. They were hypocrites. There was social injustice going on in this world also. They, they, they had a strict class system, and if you're at the top of the scale, you very seldom looked at the bottom of the scale. They, the people that were at the bottom were used for their uh, gifts and their abilities, but they're often cast aside, not paid attention to. There was social injust injustice. There was economic injustice. There were people who had nothing, and there were people who had everything that ought to have would very seldom do anything for the have-nots, and many times they would take from those that had nothing to add to what they had. Yeah. All of this was going on, and God had warned them repeatedly about their violations. Time after time, God spoke to them, and they acted like they had gotten the message but for a season, but then they fell right back into their sinful behavior. And since they were degenerate in their behavior, they kept up the same pattern. How many of us know somebody that keeps up the same pattern all the time? They, they think something's going to change, but they keep doing the same old stuff. They keep hanging with the same old people. They keep going to the same old places. They keep talking about, I'm changed. It's a new year. I'm changed. And by January 15th, they right back into the same mess because they didn't really change. They just said what they were going to do, but nothing around them changed. That's what Israel was doing. They said they had changed but they really had so God was looking at them repeating the same pattern of sin over and over and over. God said, I've had enough of this foolishness and this blatant indifference to what was required. So God raised up the Babylonians and the Assyrians to invade. And they, Israel was captured and taken into exile. The, the exile was a consequence of their sin. They, they were disobedient and unrepentant, and their actions brought God to the place where God had to stop them before it went any further. What God did was look at their faults and saw what was needed. God took a good long look at their mess. God took a good long look at their disobedience and, and God had decided that God decided what needed to happen. God looked at their faults and decided to do something different. If you've ever listened to our radio broadcast on, on Pop Gospel, you'll, you'll hear the, the, the DJ, uh, Brother Stevenson Clark, 
often when he's praying, he'll say, not only did God look beyond my faults, but God looked at my faults and still decided to bless me. And we forget that part. We, we don't think about that part. Nothing we do escapes the eyes of God. Nothing we do is ignored by God. Nothing we do is disregarded. God looks at our faults, and there are indeed consequences for our faults. Now, the 42nd chapter of Isaiah details the consequences of their faults. God, God's anger had been poured out on the nation, and they were now in exile. They'd been captured, and they were finding themselves, uh, and as said, Psalm 137 suggests, wanting to sing a song in a strange land. They were in a place they didn't recognize anything or anybody. They were enslaved to the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They were beaten if they tried to escape. They, they were forced to entertain people that, as though they were some minstrels. They, they, were, they could not even practice their religion without permission. And, 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 and our best, they were second-class citizens. Bondage was the consequence of their sinful behavior. See, their beloved city, the temple destroyed, was a consequence of sinful behavior, being separated from family members and, and not being sure of who they would ever see again was a consequence of their sinful behavior. God looked at their sins and decided enough is enough. They would not, they will not comprehend. So this had to happen. But when we turn the page to right. chapter 43. The first two words we read are, but now. but now. At this point, God has decided that even though the people did wrong, even though they have been captured and taken into exile, God sends a word to the prophet, but now. But now. This phrase shows that God has made a decision that despite what God has seen, God is going to redeem God's people. God was about to intervene in their situation. The, the question, though, in my mind always arises is, why does God do this? Why did God intervene at this particular moment? God, God was punishing them, but now God is coming to their rescue. Now, someone who looks on the surface might see God as being spiritually schizophrenic or even sadistic, enjoying somebody else's pain. But when you really understand God, when you really find out about God, you will find that God can and will punish and allow our consequences to occur, but God does not want our consequences to kill us. Yeah. 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 Let me, let me, let's look at that real close again. God allows consequences to come but God doesn't want the consequence to kill us. God doesn't want the consequence to take us out of here. Why, why is that? Well, when we look at Psalm 43, uh, and when we look at those first few verses, the first thing we see is that we are God's creation. Yeah, yeah. God created us. God formed us out of the dust of the earth. God pieced us together cell by cell, uh, organ by organ, bone by bone, tendon by tendon, muscle by muscle, laid skin on top of us and, and gave us eyes to see and ears to hear and, and legs to move, uh, fingers to, to move, gave us an opposable thumb so that we could hold things, gave us feet that we could walk and breathe the breath of life into us. We are God's creation. We are the prize of God's creation. We, according to the Psalms, are made a little bit lower than the angels. God created us as the crown of God's achievement. The only thing that's higher than us in, in, in the spiritual world is the angels, and then it's God. We are at the top of the food chain. God gave us things that God didn't give anyone else, including the will to worship and to, to praise God. We are God's creation, and when God sees God's creation suffering, even when God has allowed the punishment to be inflicted, even when God has allowed consequences to come, because they have to come, God eventually will say, but now, this is my creation, and I'm going to put a halt to this before they are destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. See, so many times we, we get in mess, and we know we did it. We know it is no question in our minds that we did. We know we made a mess. We know we 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 created a, an entire a, a, a whole lot of stuff. There's there's a couple words I could use if I wasn't in the pulpit. If you call me outside, I could tell you some other things. We created stuff. We created a bunch of junk and then got upset when it blew up in our faces. And God was standing right there when we messed it up. 
God was standing right there when the consequence happened. And God is also standing there and saying, but now I'm going to come get you because you are my child. You are my creation. You are the ones that I made out of the dust of the earth. God looks at us and yes, God looks at our faults. And God also sees that we need a but now all right, moment. All right. Another reason that God doesn't allow our consequences to kill us is that we are called by God's name. Yes. Yes. When you uh, become a believer, people look at you and they know that you're saved. They, they don't, don't, you don't have to carry a big Bible. You don't have to wear a big t-shirt that says, what would Jesus do? You don't have to wear a bracelet. You don't have to have a big bumper sticker on your car that says St. James Amy Church, 600 North 4th Street, Memphis, Tennessee, 38107. You, ain't got to, you don't have to have any of that. People can look at you and tell if you're saved. People know if you know some, if you got some Holy Ghost, they can see it from the out, from the inside out. They they can tell. So God, when we go through, sometimes people will look and say, "How is it that they say, but they still in the middle of this mess?" Well. One problem, one issue is that, yeah, we created the mess, but God's not going to leave us in the mess because God knows God's reputation is at stake if we die in the mess. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're called by God's name. We are called by God's name. We are God's beloved creation. We are the ones that are known as the children of God. We are the ones who are called the sons and daughters of God. And if we are the sons and daughters of God, God is not going to let harm come to us. If we have acknowledged who God is in our lives, even with our messy, messed up selves, when, when we get in the middle of the consequences, when God sees us about to take us out of here, God will come get us because we belong to God. God gets no glory in our destruction. Somebody, somebody here or somebody that's listening virtually, you may be saying, I, I made a mess. Now, some, some people don't say that. They won't ever say it out loud, but they're saying it in their mind. They're saying, how could I have gotten where I got? How could I be in this situation? How is it that I am where I am? And, and they're wondering, when is God ever going to come out? And there's somebody else that's watching them that's wondering the same thing. There's somebody that may want to get to know God. They want to get to know Jesus. But in their mind, they're saying, when are they going to come out? Because I'm not going to become a part of a God of a family where God lets folks just suffer. So God said, "By because you're called by God's name, God is going to come get you in due season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, God works in, in Kairos and not Kronos. Kronos is when you measure time in minutes, hours, days, seconds, months, and years. That, that's, that's, that's Kronos. That's the way we measure time. Kairos means moments. It's a particular spiritual moment where God makes a decision to intervene. And that's what many of us need to do is just wait for our Kairos moment. Wait for that moment when God decides, all right, enough is enough. Enough consequences, enough punishment. I'm coming to get them. That's because we are called by God's name and God ultimately wants to get the glory in our lives. So God's going to stop whatever punishment is going to happen. We're called. By God's name. Not only are we called by God's name, but finally, we are precious and we're honored by God. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that verse right there, that, that line that, that, that tells us that we are, are precious. That verse 4, because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you, I give people in return for you nations in exchange for your life. We've got to, to, to remember, we've got to know that we are God's most prized possession. That there was a lady in my home church, uh, Ms. Anna Stenson. Uh, she, uh, she had a, a daughter who died as an infant, and, she, and it also rendered her unable to have any more children. She wasn't able to give birth. So she adopted a son named Jeffrey, and every time Ms. Stenson prayed, she always said, I thank God for my most precious asset. She was talking about her son. He was precious to her because she could not have children, but she adopted him. She chose him out of all the babies in the world that needed adoption, that was the one that she picked, and he became her most precious asset. Well, when you look at how God thinks about you, God chose you just like that sister chose her son. God looked at you and said, there's something in them that I want to use. There's something in that person. There's something in that woman. There's something in that man. Something in that boy. Something in that girl. I can do something with God chose you, and now that since God chose you, God, you are God's most precious asset. God looks at you and sees, that's my child. I love 
them unconditionally. I want them to succeed. I want them to do better. I want them to live better. I want them to go higher. God, and we are precious to God. We are honored by God. Do you understand what it means to be honored by God? When people talk about favor ain't fair, the fact is all of us have favor because we are God's children. All of us have favor because we are honored by God. Some of us want some stuff that God doesn't intend for us to have, and then we get mad because somebody else gets it, and then we talk about favor ain't fair. No, that ain't what it's about. Favor means that God has carved out a place in this world just for you. There's something that God has called you to do that no one else is able to do. There's something God has put in you that God has not put in anyone else. You are precious and honored in God's sight. I don't care what's happened at work. I don't care what's happened at church. I don't care who's out speaking to you. I don't care who doesn't want to hear you sing. I don't care who doesn't want to hear you preach. I don't care who doesn't want to hear your voice. The fact is, God said that you are precious. And because you're precious, you're going to have your butt down moment. Because you're precious, you're going to have a time when God's going to come down and say, enough is enough. You've suffered enough. You've been through enough. You've suffered enough consequences. So now. Yeah. Yeah. the consequences, but now God said, I'm coming to redeem you. God looked at them and decided that God would not allow the consequences to kill them. That's one thing I really want you to understand. Your consequences could take you out of here. The stuff that you've gotten into, some of you, if you think back, some of you ain't got to think back too long. If you think back to what you used to do, how you used to live, where you used to go, the neighborhood you used to hang out in, some of the folk that you used to hang with, the bullet hit them and didn't hit you. Some of the folk that you used to hang with, they had cancer. You were doing the same thing, and you are still cancer-free. Some of the folk that you used to... Oh. Oh. They died and they're in the grave, but you are right here. And that's because God stopped the consequence from killing you. You've got to understand that, that God will decide in the due season when to pull you out of the hands of the enemy. God did not look beyond their faults. God doesn't look beyond our faults, but God looks at our faults and still decides to bless us. God will tell us, but now, and we all need a but now moment. Some of us have been sick, but God said, but now there's healing. Some of us have been in bondage, and God said, but now there's deliverance. Some of us have been confused, but God said, but now there's order. Some of us have been deep in sin, and God said, but now I'm redeeming you. Some of us have been guilty as sin. And God said, but now there's mercy. Some of us should have died. And God said, but now there's grace. Some of us should have been out of here. But God said, but now I got something better for you. Some of us thought we were going to get fired. God said, but now there's a promotion. Some of us, we thought we weren't going to see 2022. God said, but now, don't think we this year. Some of us didn't know if we would make it this far. God said, but now, grace and mercy is sufficient for you. Your my grace and my mercy walk with you now and always. God said, but now. Somebody need to look at your neighbor. Step from a high five in these workplaces and say, but now. I'm here. But now. I'm free. But now. I'm delivered. But now. I'm set free. But now. God's got me. Yes, I was a mess. Yes, I was in my sin. Yes, I deserve death. But God said, but now. Understand your butt down moment is coming. It may not come today, it may not come in the morning. I can't tell you when, but your butt now is coming. Your butt now moment is on its way. God's God gonna look at you and say, Yeah, you are a mess, but now I got something better for you. God, God's gonna look at you and say, Yeah, you blew it, but now I'm gonna do something better with you. But now. Amen. But now. Mm. I like this one myself, y'all. But now, because when I think about where I could be, I ain't always been right. So, pastors, preachers, think we 
please. Some of us are hot mess, some of us were hot mess, some of us still are hot mess. All right. Just tell the truth. All right. And God says, but now, God is saying, but now the St. James. Yes. We've been through some stuff. We've been through a lot of stuff as a church. Yes. Some of you know in detail, in vivid, living color, what this church has been through. But God is coming with a but now moment to say enough is enough. Yeah. I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to make you greater. I'm going to make you stronger. I'm going to make you more powerful in the spirit. But now. But now. But now. But now. Let, us, let us pray. God, we thank you, thank you. for this moment in time. We say thank you. God, we understand that, yes, we messed up. We, we were in our sin. We were in our stuff. God, there are consequences that we have been through, but you looked at us and said, but now is something different coming. But now there's something new on the way. God, we say thank you for the but now moment. We say thank you, God, for, for the but now time. We say thank you for that Kairos moment, that moment in time when you're going to step out of heaven and stop whatever is going on and put us in a new and a wonderful place. God, we thank you for the but now. In Jesus' name, amen. There may be someone today, maybe listening virtually or maybe someone in the sanctuary that wants a closer walk with Jesus, you you waited for your but now moment. Let me help you understand one important thing. You've got to be a part of the family of Christ to experience your but now moment. You, you can't expect God to just open up windows for you if you plan with God. God said, this now is the time to be real. And the first step in being real is acknowledging that you are a sinner that needs grace and needs mercy. If, if that's you today, I just want you to take a moment and pray the simple prayer with me. I, Father God, I am a sinner and I need your grace. God, I have made too many mistakes to count and now I want to be a part of your family. I need to repent of my sin. I turn my back on my sin. I believe that Jesus was born into this world for me. Jesus walked this earth to show me how to live. Jesus died on the cross and shed blood to cover my sins. Jesus went down into hell to, to wrestle the keys of death, hell, and the grave out of the hands of the enemy. And now I know and believe that Jesus rose for me on the third day and will return for me. I thank you, God, for my salvation. I thank you for my salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, I ask you to put your information, your name, telephone number, or email in our direct messenger or email us at St. James Memphis at gmail.com. At St. James Memphis at gmail.com. Let me also say you may already be saved, uh, but you're looking for a church home. You're between homes. You, you, you are spiritually homeless, if you will. You, you left one place. I don't know what happened, and it doesn't matter to me. But I'm also asking if you need a church home. You can be part of our virtual church, our e-church family, or you can be a part of our physical family. Join us here at 9.30 every Sunday morning at St. James, 600 North 4th Street. So if that's you, again, give us your information. If there's someone in the sanctuary that wants to be a part of our church family, come on down. We'll pray with you and welcome you into the family. We thank God for what God is doing in this place on today.